This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University. And today I want to talk about Bitcoin's self-healing properties. In other words, how the Bitcoin network is able to heal itself even after a network partition or after some sort of attack. Now, why does this matter? This matters for context behind the whole debate between proof of work and proof of stake. We know that Ethereum is going to be moving to proof of stake maybe later this year. And I just want to point out how much more robust proof of work is. There are a lot of people who think that proof of work, which is a consensus mechanism that's used um, by the Bitcoin miners to secure Bitcoin, a lot of people think that proof of work wastes energy. I've talked about this before, and I've argued that proof of work wastes energy in the same way that your dishwasher, your washing machine, your dryer, and your computer waste energy. They're only considered to be wastes of energy if you don't get value from what they are uh, from what they're doing with that electricity. So maybe you want to wash all your dishes by hand. I myself prefer labor-saving devices and modern technology. And proof of work is really, it's not a bug in Bitcoin. It really is a feature. It's something that's very, very important and that helps to make the network robust. And there's no equivalent in proof of stake as we're going to see. Now we're going to discuss two different examples. The first one is very well known and I've discussed it before. And then we'll end this lecture which with a much more obscure example that uh, I think is very, very important in highlighting the differences between proof of stake and proof of work. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, if you're a regular viewer, I would just ask you right now to subscribe and like this video, maybe share it with a few friends. So the first example of the Bitcoin network healing itself is what happened last year. So for many years, the Bitcoin hash rate, most of the Bitcoin mining was being done in China, which makes sense because uh, a lot of the Bitcoin miners were made there. There's low electricity costs and it seems like everything industrial is done in China these days. So it made sense. But then we had the situation in mid 2021 when the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, banned Bitcoin mining. And so what, we do, what would you expect to happen? Critics of Bitcoin always said if China ever bans Bitcoin mining, it's going to kill Bitcoin or crash the network. But this was a very, very interesting test of the Bitcoin network because it did not go offline at all. It remained up and running for 100% of the time during the transition when the Bitcoin miners in China, they had to turn off their machines, they had to pack them up, try to get them out of the country and plug them in somewhere else. And also we had a lot of uh, Bitcoin mining start in other parts of the world at the same time because the profit margins the profit margins got, got very high for a while and it became less competitive to mine Bitcoin. And so what happened, it, what happened was that the Bitcoin network really reconstituted itself outside of China and Bitcoin was able to win again. This was example, a, a, an example of how the Bitcoin network healed itself. Basically, the Bitcoin miners moved, they plugged in the machines again, and now everything is back the way it was. It instead, uh, but it, things are better now because these Bitcoin miners are in f they're far less concentrated. Uh, they're in many, many more different countries now. So it's become uh, this attack on Bitcoin by the CCP has made Bitcoin more decentralized. As a thought experiment, you can imagine if Amazon or Google had most of their servers or were somehow concentrated in China and they got banned by China, it's very unlikely that their networks would remain up in the same way that Bitcoin remained up and running 100% uh, of the time. If you contrast this with something like the Solana network, the Solana network crashes and goes down. Just, it seems like every few months, and it's not even being attacked by China. It's just uh, not a very, not a very well-run network. And um, but it just really contrasts with with Bitcoin, which has had 99.99 percent uh, uptime since the uh, since the creation of the Bitcoin network. We could also contrast this with gold mines. If you had a gold mine in China and China banned gold miners or banned foreign gold miners, you'd be in a lot of trouble. You can't pick up your gold mine and leave. But with Bitcoin, it's very easy to pick up your miners and leave. So this is the first example. I'll link to a couple articles about it. China's attacking the Bitcoin miners and then how Bitcoin mining was able to recover from this in just a series of months. We can see that the hash rate recovered from its July lows in 2021, right after the China ban, and we're back up at uh, very close to all-time new highs in the hash rate. So the Bitcoin network is just as secure and probably more secure, more decentralized than it was before the China ban. For our sep second example, we're going to use an example that, that talks about 
these um, underwater cables that carry the internet between continents. You have the transatlantic cables, which we can see on the right side here. You have the transpacific cables, and this is one way that the internet is, is hardwired all around the globe. So let's pretend something happens. Let's pretend that North America, Central America, and South America are isolated. Let's pretend this becomes one big island where the cables, uh, the cables are severed, all the, uh, the undersea cables are, set, are, are severed. Let's also assume that 80% of Bitcoin mining, this isn't true, but let's assume that 80% of the Bitcoin mining hash rate is in North America and South America. 20% of the hash rate is everywhere else. And as we said, let's say that there's an attack or there's an accident that takes out all the transatlantic and transpacific undersea internet cables. And let's also assume that there are no satellite or, or other kind of uh, uh, connections for the internet. So we have North America, Central America, South America as one giant stranded Bitcoin mining island. And let's say that this goes on for a week. So you have the North American and South American Bitcoin miners, they keep producing blocks. And then the rest of the world keeps producing blocks. As we said, let's assume that the rest of the world is just 20% of the hash rate. So from the perspective of the rest of the world, let's say Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, etc., from their perspective, when these cables are cut, 80% of the Bitcoin hash power just disappears. And let's also assume that we're between these what are called difficulty adjustments, which happen every certain number of blocks, approximately every two weeks. And this is where the mining algorithm, the difficulty of mining Bitcoin gets adjusted based on the current hash power. So if there's too much hash power, the difficulty adjustment will ratchet up and make it more difficult to mine a block. If there's less hash power, it will ratchet down and make it less difficult to mine a block. The purpose of this is to keep the average block time at about 10 minutes. So let's assume though that we're between these two week difficulty adjustments. What this means is that when 80% of the hash rate disappears from the perspective of the 20% of the world, it's gonna be very difficult for that 20% for Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia to mine very many blocks because they have 20% of the global hash power, but you haven't had a difficulty adjustment yet. And so it's, it's very difficult to mine the blocks. And I think we can say approximately that, that Europe, Asia, and Africa in this situation, they would mine 20% of the blocks and then North and South America would mine 80% of the blocks, something roughly like that, um, because it's, it's really a probability game when you're mining Bitcoin blocks. And the more hash power you have, the higher the probability that you find the nonce that allows you to, to mine and seal the next block. So it's going to be very difficult for this 20% minority to mine blocks, simply because their hash rate is very small percentage of the full hash rate that existed before the network was partitioned. And so we'll have a situation where North America, South America, Central America start producing most of the blocks, 80% of the blocks, since they're going to still have most of the hash power. Again, this is what's called a network partition, where we have uh, part of the network in, in cut off from the other part of the network. So we, it's, it's uh, North and South America versus the rest of the world. And in a situation like this, you're going to end up with two Bitcoin blockchains. One version of the Bitcoin blockchain is going to be the one being mined in North and South America. Again, North and South America, we're assuming here, cannot communicate with the, with the rest of the world. They can't do it using transatlantic cables, undersea cables, or satellite internet. And so they'll be mining their own block in North and South America, their own blockchain. And this version of the blockchain presumably is going to be longer since North and South America have more hash power. Then there's going to be another version of the Bitcoin blockchain in Europe, Asia, and Africa, which will presumably be shorter since they have less hash power. They only have 20% of the hash power. So here's the question. We have two Bitcoin blockchains here, and this is a big problem. Which one is the real Bitcoin blockchain that everyone's going to use and trust? Do we need to call up Satoshi on the phone, try to find his phone number uh, using an internet search, search, call him and have him come back and tell us which is the real Bitcoin blockchain. The good news is we don't need to, to do that. And so let's demonstrate this by talking through the next steps in this, this thought experiment. So let's say that after one week, all of those undersea cables are magically restored and repaired. Obviously, this is an unrealistic timeline, but let's just assume that these two separate blockchains have been, been mined separately for two weeks. So once those undersea cables are restored, all the world's Bitcoin miners you'll again have a global internet. They can all talk to each other. 
and uh, decide which chain they are going to mine on. But then you have this debate, which one is the real Bitcoin blockchain? Is it the North South American one or is it the European, Asian, African one? Now, fortunately, there's nothing subjective about picking which one is the real Bitcoin blockchain once this network partition is resolved. There's nothing subjective about it. The real Bitcoin blockchain is always going to be the longest chain. The one with the most blocks. Technically, I think it's the one with the most accumulated proof of work, but in most cases, it ends up being the same thing. And th this is what's called a fork choice rule. It's part of uh, the, the Nakamoto consensus, where you basically pick the longest or heaviest chain, and that becomes uh, that's always the real Bitcoin blockchain. This is defined by the protocol. And so you don't need to have a, a human actor outside like Satoshi telling you which one is the real one if you have a network partition. So what's going to happen is you're basically going to have what's called a reorg or reorganization, and the European, Asian, African Bitcoin miners will start mining on top of the North South American Bitcoin blockchain. That one will be decided to be the canonical Bitcoin blockchain, and that will be the one that's used going forward. Now, what we've just witnessed here in this thought experiment is actually amazing. It's what we call a network partition and rejoin, but we've seen an example here of how the Bitcoin network can heal itself with zero outside intervention. You don't need Satoshi to come back. You don't need Jerome Powell or the president of the United States to tell you which is the real Bitcoin. And you wouldn't want something like that because if, if North America and South America, if these different parts of the world are hostile to one another, we talked about the undersea cables getting cut. This is something that could obviously happen in some sort of war or attack. And so in this case, we don't want human actors deciding which one's the real blockchain. We want an algorithmic way of deciding that. And the fork choice rule tells us that the longest, heaviest blockchain, uh, Bitcoin blockchain, is the real blockchain that will be used going forward. And by being used going forward, what I mean is that all the Bitcoin miners in the world will then compete going forward to mine the next block and attach it to that Bitcoin. Uh, that version of the blockchain. Now, here's really the punchline. Try doing this with Ethereum once they've transitioned to proof of stake. As far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no non-subjective way, way to heal our partitioned Ethereum proof of stake network. There's no non-subjective way to decide which blockchain is the real one. You probably have to get Vitalik on the phone or some of the the, uh, the oligarchs that run Ethereum, get them on the phone and have them pick which blockchain is the real one under proof of stake. And so you end up with a situation where Vitalik ends up being just like the Treasury Secretary or the US President or the Federal Reserve Chairman, and you've created a new oligarchic centralized system. This is the problem with proof of stake. It's just not as good decentralized and secure as proof of work for this reason and for various other reasons that I've talked about in previous videos. The prospects of a network partition like we talked about, undersea cables getting cut, are actually very real in this decade. In this world that's rapidly falling apart, that's trending towards revolution, war, biotech attacks, cyber attacks, uh, monetary reset. So this is something that at some point in time, if not this decade, certainly this century, cryptocurrency networks will need to deal with. They'll need to deal with a global partition. And so when people say proof of work is so wasteful, it's only wasteful if you haven't gone down the rabbit hole and if you don't value Bitcoin and if you don't understand Bitcoin. What's really wasteful is, well, first of all, proof of stake just doesn't work. It's not nearly secure. It's much easy. It's much more prone to capture. And there's no way to decide which is the right chain in a network partition. Uh, and so you're really, you're, your only choices are using energy to secure the system. You can use proof of work like Bitcoin uses, or you can use proof of war like the fiat system uses. When, uh, when Saddam Hussein decided to sell his crude oil for euros instead of US dollars, it did not end well for him. This is a, a photograph of the, the bombing of Baghdad. And the same thing happened with Gaddafi in Libya when he decided to sell his oil for something other than dollars. So your, real, your only real choices if you want a robust, secure system is proof of work or proof of war. And I, for my, for my own part, would definitely prefer proof of work. Still uses just a tiny fraction, less, less than 1% of global energy. Bitcoin energy usage does not scale with transactions. You can have much larger transactions or many more transactions, and you're not going to use any more energy. This is another 
common misconception. But proof of work is very, very elegant and it's very important to securing the system. And as we've seen with proof of stake, there's just, uh, it's not secure and it will run into problems if there ever is a network partition. If you found this video helpful, I'd encourage you also to check out my course on Bitcoin, where I really go deep down the rabbit hole. I talk a lot about how the Bitcoin network works, how full nodes work and miners work, uh, empty block attacks, uh, Bitcoin's natural superpower, why Bitcoin is so volatile. And then there's a series of lectures that people are really enjoying, how to buy Bitcoin anonymously without KYC, how to run your own full node, how to connect your own full node to a Bitcoin wallet on your desktop or laptop, how to set up hardware wallets, how to set up, uh, I'm working currently working on a lecture on multi-sig and how to set that up, kind of a DIY, multi-vendor, multi-sig. So if you're interested in that, be sure to click on the link in the description notes below, and then use the coupon code YT99, as in YouTube 99, to get the best price. You'll get access to the Bitcoin course, as well as all of my other courses on, uh, on Trader, on, on the paid version of Trader University. So be sure to check that out. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. Let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.